This is a, a kind of a weird conversation for me in so many ways because, you know, when I first started listening to this guy, I was a broke college student. Um, and, you know, I'll explain more of our relationship as the time goes on, but another way this is weird is I found like that I'm older than you, which <laughs> I looked at the, like this date of birth, I was like, wait a minute. So, it, you know, but on a hip hop side, you have way more years than me. Um, so we're going to play some music, we're going to talk and kind of walk through time for a minute. Okay. Um, so let's start in like, let's start in like 1995. Okay. And I'm going to play three songs, which wasn't made in 1995, but <laughs> I, I want like, to you tell you. Songs from 1995. Right. How y'all doing? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. This is Mr. Talib Kweli Green. How y'all doing? Everybody. Um, appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all. So I'm going to play three songs. That, they, they weren't made in 1995, okay. but I want to, you know, dealing with hip hop in 95, I want you to tell me what they mean right Okay. Off. About to hear that? That's David Bowie. It's nothing to do with me. <laughs> okay, that's the first song. Right. Okay. This is the second song. Is that from that? That's for me to listen. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Grandmaster Ca Grandmaster Flash and Furious. Right. Melly Melanin. And this is the third song. Is that um, cooling again? Yeah. All right. What you got to say? Which in '95 turned into Mace. That's all Bad Boy said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Puffy got away with Samuel and David Bowie. Yeah, yeah. This Mace, you know what I'm saying? You got when Mace said. H I W A I I. Right. He said, uh, Puff, watch out, I'm a daha. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Mace, don't you stop smoking Lala? Okay. Watch out, I'm a daha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you get the point. So I, I am, um, I'm a college student in 1995, and, and around this particular time, this is where I. I thought that hip hop started to lose itself. Um, <coughs> and this was permeating the, the airways, more like 96 and 97, more so than the tribes and the Wu Tangs and the outcasts that I, you know, started to listen to. What were you doing in 1995? Um, I was working for Puff. Wow. I was, I was, I was, it was that, those records a little later. Right. That, that's that. Ninety six, ninety seven. Right. Yeah. Um. But um. You know, when I was in high school, I was working for Stress Entertainment, which was Jessica Rosenbaum, mm -hmm. and uh, she, she ran a bunch of uh, Jessica Rosenbaum and Diddy. Right. And they had a DJ crew called Flip Squad. It was Funkmaster Flex, DJ Enough, Mad Wayne, Budokan, and Bismarcky. Okay. Um. And you grew up in Park Slope. Yes. Right. Which. You know, we talked about Park Slope mm -hmm. before, and you know the stereotype for everybody when it comes to hip hop is all hip hoppers and rappers grew up in a bad neighborhood. Um, but Park Slope is not. Well, there's a qualifier to that. It's not. It's, <laughs> okay. it's not now. Right. You know what I'm it but was I, then. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I didn't grow up on Eighth Avenue or Seventh Avenue. Right. Of course. Or even I, I grew up on President Street between Fifth and Sixth. But it wasn't Brownsville though. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't Brownsville. It wasn't East New York. It wasn't Best Stuy. Right. It wasn't none of that. Um, but it was it was definitely safer than all those those notorious neighborhoods, you know. But just like any inner city neighborhood, um, you know, it was it was black and brown people on my block, and it was you know what it's like. It was like it looked my block, and it's not you know this my block looked like Sesame Street. If you watch Sesame Street, and it looked like like it looked like Oscar was gonna be in the garbage <laughs> can. That's what it looked like. you know what I'm saying. Like a lot of it was very diverse. Very multicultural, right? You know, like like like. Let's. I'm I'm part of the, the New York City Sesame Street generation. I I was born maybe around the same year that that program Sesame Street Electric Company. Those programs, like the right. inner city programs that were on public television, were taking their cues from diverse inner city life. And so these things were presented 
on, on a national scale, but to me that looked, that felt like where I lived. And, and your mom is a professor. As a professor, yeah. Correct. And, you know, that comes, that, my mom's an educator as well, so that comes with a whole different type of responsibility, even if you want to do the art. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you to want to do the art form of MCN? <clears throat> um, I think just hip hop in general um, raised me to the same degree that my parents did. Okay. Um, and, and the city, New York City. Right. And that's to, not to take nothing away from my parents, but we're talking specifically my experience as, as a musician. Um, I'm, I'm the son of Brenda Perry Green. I'm the child in New York City, you know, born at the time I was born in. Hip hop was just so, it was, it was a part of the fabric of the city. Of course. So even though I was a little kid, I wasn't, um, I, was, I wasn't, I didn't grow up break dancing. I didn't grow up writing graffiti. Right. I was always a writer. Right. I wrote poetry, I wrote plays, and hip hop was a way to be a writer, but still be cool when I was little. Of course. You know what I'm saying? So my introduction to hip hop was, you know, I knew it on the radio, I knew the big songs, I knew the Run DMCs and the Beastie Boys, the big records, but I wasn't in hip hop culture until about junior high school. Okay. In junior high school, I wanted to be down with the kids who I thought was cool. The kids who I thought looked cool and dressed fly and everything, they was in hip hop. So my, my, my way in was, oh, I could write raps. You know what I'm saying? I could write po oh, that's just poetry, I could do that. You know what I'm Which one of those dudes that was cool was Dante Smith. Yes. AKA Dante Bizet. Yes. AKA Most Def. Yeah, many AKA many, Yassin many, right. many names. Many names. <laughs> um, and, you know, like I said at the time, we're in a time where Bad Boy was running the radio, mm -hmm. Bad Boy Entertainment. And for us who grew up off of um, just the thing that Q Tip started, <coughs> which we'll talk about as well. Yeah. Um, not necessarily so message heavy. Some had a message, but it was a feel good, euphoric. You know, if it was a sample in the song, we dug for it. It wasn't a complete just, holly, let's just rap over Hollywood swinging. That's not right. what it was. So, Rockers Records. Mm -hmm. How did you get to Rockers, or how did Rockers get to you, or what was, what's the story wow, behind okay, that? Okay, so one of my early rhyme partners back in the day was John Forte. Right. Went on to uh, become famous for the Fugees and some other things. It, some other things. Few <laughs> other things, right. Um, um, Forte was, you know, Forte was one of my, and still to this day, is one of my greatest artistic inspirations. This man pushed me. He produced my first demo. When I was rapping, he was like, yo, you, you, you rapping too much. You got to write in 16 bars. You have to have a hook. Like, I didn't, I didn't care about none of that until I met Forte. You know, Forte was really trying to make it. Right. I got into working with Stress because the, she also, Jessica also managed Forte. That was the only rapper she had. Right. She had a bunch of DJs, she had a rapper. Forte went to, like myself, he was a kid from Brooklyn that went, got sent away to boarding school. I got sent away to Cheshire Academy. He got sent away to F Phillips Exeter Academy. Um, we both would come home and spend our weekends freestyling in Washington Square Park. Then we decided together to go to NYU to attend NYU. So that was my roommate my first uh, year at NYU. Um, but Forte was also five percenter, um, God body dude. And he sort of was a, this great mixture of this, cause he's from Brownsville. Right. Um, he's from Brownsville. Um, and he was rolling around with these cats, uh, Population Click, which was Shabar Allah, and Allah's son, rest in peace. Um, and these guys were very influential on in Wu-Tang, like, um, just grimy Brownsville God body rap. Okay. That raucous Forte, uh, Jared and Brian were people that Forte met in high school and they were Brown University students when he brought them to the hood. And gotcha. see, I was at this point, I was hanging out with like Prodigal Son, Hellraiser, Killer Priest, 60 Second Assassin. I was hanging out like with the Wu Tang B team. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was my crew. You see? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, do you know? And can you explain what the Wu-Tang B-Team is well, to people Well, you know, original Wu-Tang is, is Inspector Deck, Raekwon the Chef, the original Ghostface nine. Killer, Old right. Dirty Bastard, Master Killer, like right. the original nine and ten if you count Capadonna. Right. Some, some, sometimes they say Capadonna's the original Wu-Tang and he went to jail and he got out. Right. Um, but then they have, everybody got a cousin, everybody got a friend who can rap. You know, half of them was Riz's cousins, you know, because Riz is a Brooklyn dude. Um, no, it's, it's like Jizz's peoples and Riz's peoples and Old Dirty Bastards too, because Jizz and Riz and Old Dirty Bastards all family. That's like the Brooklyn part of Wu Tang. Right. So it's like offshoot to them dudes. 
Um, so there was Grooves' Population Click, which turned into the Rose Family. There was Seven Universal, um, which they used to be Universal Soldiers, but then they got sued for the name because of the movie. Um, they became, right. So I was hanging out with all these dudes and Raucus, the two dudes from Raucus, Jared and Brian, they came to, to we were staying in Crown Heights at Makiba Mooncycle's house. Makiba Mooncycle and Prodigal Son was roommates. And so all these, they found out that these two dudes were starting a label were gonna come and everybody converged, like 40 MCs converged on this one apartment. And everybody rapped. And for me, that's when I met the dudes from Raucus. Gotcha. But it, the competition level was so rah, 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 rah that I stepped back and I didn't even try to get a deal that day. I just rapped and hung out. But then a couple years later, they put out the most death record. The, if you, if you can hear. Yeah, you hear, Jesus Christ. And uh, a universal magnetic. Right. And I saw that and I saw Rock, cause I'm like, I know these dudes and I knew most. So I asked him, I said, yo, what happened? He was like, they gave me $5,000, right? And I, I, I think I was 18, 19. I couldn't even imagine ever holding $5,000. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, that was just like, what? So I went to them. I went and set up a meeting, and I was like, yo, you gave Most Def $5,000. What's up with my five? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had a song with Most Def on it, um, four to five. I'm about to play it. Right, so I had that song. So they gave me $5,000 for that song. And um, that was how I got on Ruckus. This is 45 Live. I'm not gonna play through the speakers. Yeah, it can't play through the speakers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I just bought a speaker too, it's at the hotel. The highest caliber, make it a night to remember like Shalimar, then escape to a man or with a solder, do what I got. Place the shot down, the Cuban air space. Okay, so that's 45 Live. Yeah, we was talking about Sada on that record. And, it, and you were talking about Sada School. Yeah. So, at this particular point, I've totally given up on the radio as a college student. <coughs> um, 100%. And, bef you know, for the young people in the classroom, there was life before the internet. <laughs> um, but the internet is a way... Rockers served two purposes. Well, Rockers and the internet was the same, served the same purpose. It was a refuge for the ones who were sick of hip hop at the time. So we ran towards the internet to find music and we ran to Rockers for the refuge to give us what we felt that was missing in hip hop at the time um, for us. But when you got to Rockers, mm -hmm. and we, you and I talked about this before, it was you and Most Def, mm -hmm. but it, were also, it was also Company Flow. It was Company Flow and Shabam Sadiq and Black Attack and Sir Menelik and Big, uh, not Big, there was Big L later, but before Big L was L Fudge. Right. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of artists, a lot. Brockus was throwing shit at the wall to see what stuck. That's what they was doing. And, and in Company Flow was, you know, a yeah. lot of kids don't know that LP yeah. was in a group called Company Flow was yeah. now in <laughs> Run the Jewels. Right, see, it, the interesting thing about LP is that this, LP from Run the Jewels is a, is a damn genius. Before Raucus, he worked in like for Sony or worked for some other company. And he worked in the mail room at a record company, but he's a rapper from New York. Um, and he just, he peeped, he peeped game early. So before Raucus, he started um, official recordings. I think it's called official. Um, it was him and a, a guy named Amici. Um, and they put out the early company flow records. Raucus basically bought into LP's business model. They saw what LP was doing. They said, that's it the uh, servicing vinyl to underground hip hop heads who really want it at these little local stores. Raucous basically bought into it and they took over and L official recordings partners up with Raucous. So then, then, the, then the company Flow Records start coming out on Raucous. But there was an early split early because LP has always been on his independent grind. So early in the game, he got frustrated with having it. Do, well, like when, me, when Black Star was cracking, company Flow was moving away from Raucous. He, because he was, and he started, um, what is indelible? Indelible yeah. recorder? He started with indel defini and definitive jux. De de definitive jux. Which he just kept, he just kept starting new situations to just keep it more and more in the house. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, I learned a lot from watching that dude. And to see him be our age and be relevant to a newer generation of hip, him and, and, and Mike. But I, I know, I know that it, and Mike is a great rapper and Mike is wonderful, but I, I could see that as LP because I know how he moves in his business. And so f for me to see how successful Run the Jewels is, I mean, there's a race component there too. 
But for me to see how successful it is, I know that LP navigated certain things to make sure that Run the Jewels got the looks it was supposed to get. And that's from his official recordings, raucous stuff from back in the day. And, and Definitive Jux released Murs and I's first record, that's uh, right. 316. Um, and let's, let's talk about the racial component for a second because, you know, we talked about this before. You said when you first went on the road, <laughs> you went, because you as black <coughs> as they come. You don't follow this guy on Twitter. If you ever question this man's blackness. Okay. So, so you're on, you know, you're on Rockers and you start to do tours. And Russell Simmons talks about this in Hip Hop Evolution. He talks about the the white space or the hole in the market mm -hmm. when it comes to alternative white kids who mm -hmm. listen to alternative music. So you're going on tour and all you see, the name of, the name of your most Dev's album, we'll talk about it in a second, is Black Star, mm -hmm. right? Which is from the Black Star Lions theme ship. And you're going out in the, in, on the road and it's white kids. Right. <clears throat> well, I mean, let's just, just from a purely economic point of view. Right. Um, white kids are the ones with the money. Right. So whether you're going to go see Gucci Man or going to see Drake or going to see Black Star, it's going to be a mostly white audience. Of course. Um, unless you're a hip hop artist who has a current radio hit and then you're doing a, a local club in the hood, which is not really a theater, but it's more of a nightclub and you're going and you're doing, a, you're doing two or three songs over your vocals. That's a more black experience. And, and yeah, and there are some hip hop artists that are just so black, you know, and I'm not talking about the subject matter, but I'm talking about... Um, their personal experience is a very, very uniquely African American experience. Right. That they have a you know uniquely black audience. But name any hip hop artist that tours on the road and they have a white audience. Do you um, think it's a difference in white audiences though, from um, the Drake white audience and the white audience that wants to hear about liberation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, the I, I get a white audience that's certainly more progressive and and academic and you know you know stuff like that but and drake might get a more teeny bopper white audience than i get you know i mean that's just you know it, it, you know it he won the great he won a grammy for half rap half song they got a new category and all that right just for drake just for drake <laughs> <laughs> so you know of course he gets that you know um but i mean yes there is something to be said about the fact that there's, there, there's been a shift there there's ha there has been i'm glad you brought this up because it's been a shift when i first when i, I went to boarding school so I was around white kids. I was around white kids who, before hip hop was corporate everything, like white kids who were just, who were coming to me like, how do you make your hair do that? Like right. that type of white kid. Like right. never, never seen a black person, never heard a rap song before the internet. I remember that, you know what I'm saying? And, um, and those kids that I related to were into the hardcore scene. Um, they were into Bad Religion and Dinosaur Jr. and Operation Ivy. And these were like r hardcore rock bands that had message music, and that was the connection. The connection with these white kids that I got along with in high school to hip hop was the message. Exactly. So when you when you get something like there was a movie called Judgment Night. Yep. And there was a soundtrack, the Judgment Night soundtrack. And Daylight they, was on that. And soundtrack. Daylight with a um, teenage fan club. Fan club, right? Mm -hmm. They paired all the hot, trendy white bands with the, the trendy rappers at the time. It was Karis One and REM, right? Which is a crazy sounding song. <laughs> <laughs> this song is so insane. But um, there, was a, there was a connection there. I, I went to see Ice-T and Body Count and Bad, Bad Religion open at the Ritz, and it was mostly white. But the, the, there was the kids who were, you could, you could know that if a white kid, you, back, in the, back then you saw a white kid with baggy jeans and baseball hat, you like, he's down with the cause. And you said he's down with the cause because you knew that associating yourself with hip hop means associating yourself with social justice, just by default. Now in Trump's America, you know, we have white people who are into hip hop who don't associate with social justice. As a matter exactly. of fact, go out their way to try to diss social justice. Right. Now you have people who are straight white supremacists, rappers even, you know what I'm saying? Who roll with so-called social justice people, who, who, who go out their way to disparage black people, to go out their way to silence black people in hip hop. Now, I've done more, songs with white rappers than anybody and i'll take the pepsi challenge you know what i'm saying like i don't rap the most beautiful thing about hip-hop is that it's a skill-based thing exactly that's the most beautiful thing about hip-hop is that it check your race at the door check your prejudice at the door if you got the skills you are what you are hip-hop you are welcome in hip-hop it's, it's it's ground level is one of the most uniquely fair things that we've ever seen 
Um, but we cannot mistake the fact that it was started with black and brown people out of oppression, out of struggle. So because of that, there's a social justice aspect of it. So, I, you know, you have people like Lord Jamal who say, like, white people are guests in the house of hip hop. While I relate to that and I understand his phrasing, why he says that, I don't necessarily phrase it like you were guest in the house of hip hop. Because to me, that, that, that implies that, you know, you could get kicked out for the slightest infraction. Right. You know, which is, which is kind of true. You know but that saying? goes for anybody, though. It's, yeah, you know, right. I, you know, I, I don't, I, I grew up with, I, there's white people I know who are so hip hop, they're so hip hop that I wouldn't consider them a guest in the, in the house. They live here. Eminem. That's that's one of them. Amongst others, Ari the Rugged Man, Mac Miller. Um, there's there's others. There's there's plenty. To Macklemore. Macklemore. That's damn right. Right. Um, because not necessarily because of his musical output, but because he understands the social justice aspect of it. And that's what's that's that's key. So it's just interesting to me now to see, uh, and not just with the rise of Trump, but also the rise of being anonymous online and being able to say things behind a screen that you wouldn't say in person. No you didn't even have the, the, the chance, you wouldn't even be in the room to say. You know, so now people letting their true feelings out um, about how they feel as, as hip hop. And it's our responsibility, maybe not the people in this room, but maybe, maybe not all of y'all, but some of y'all, it's definitely me and this man's responsibility as curators of the culture. And I don't say that to be hyperbolic, but this man is actually be at Duke and be at Harvard and be at the Smithsonian, actually curating the culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I go to these museums, I see Black Star there. So I take that seriously, you know? And um, as, as curators of the culture, we have to be able to be like, yo, if you are involved in hip hop, you are speaking, uh, uh, you are representing the voice of oppressed people. And even, even when you hear oppressed people, like rappers, trap rappers, gangster rappers, rappers talking about I'm a pimp, rappers talking about things that you may not relate to, they are speaking a, a painful experience. They are, they are vocalizing it and they are expressing it. So it may not be in a language um, that you want to hear or a canister or a container that you're used to, and it may be offensive. But the key to it, I think, is loving hip hop, whether it's convenient to love it or not. Um, if we only love it when it's speaking di directly to us, you don't really love it. You fetishize it, just like some of these white boys who think they could just say whatever the niggas because they they rap. Mm -hmm. Damn it! Oh, we got sound. Watch moon to be aspired to reflect their own people's death. But whose entertainment shall we sing of agony? And what hopes that the destroyers aspire and to extinguish us the sun to suffer remorse at the sight of their own fantastic success? The last episode of Dream Post Dream is dead. It's killed by the saviors of his own dream. Armor. I'm not a human being in no spiritual shit. A spiritual being manifested as a human, that's it. That is 2000 seasons. Um, so. Say you from Brooklyn. You skipped all these producers and went to Cincinnati. Yes. Yeah. And found a dude by the name of High Tech. Yes. How? I'm glad you did, don't get me wrong, but Um Everybody in Brooklyn that I knew at the time who was an artist was broke. Okay. And so there was, you know, there was one guy would have equipment, but he was a guy that like, you know, he had to go work and you can only work, you know for two hours at the studio when he had time and stuff. So it'd be like 14 rappers waiting for one producer, waiting for one engineer to get off of work. You know what I'm saying? And um, I was going to NYU and my roommate, Devon, uh, from Cincinnati, um, I met this other cat through him named Amari who came to stay with us. Cause my dorm, my dorm was just like the dorm that everybody stayed when they came into town. Omari, me and Devon became roommates. I lived across the street from um, Lance Rivera, <coughs> Big Un. He had an apartment with Daddy-O from Stetson Sonic. Wow. Daddy-O was managing Mike and Nine for Freestyle Fellowship. So Mike and Nine came, and then Mike, then me, I met Mike at a bodega behind a Dutch master. And, and then, Micah came, <laughs> then Micah came to live with us. You know what I'm saying? So it was me, Omari, Micah, and a producer named Lunatic Blue from Lyricist Lounge. We all living in his apartment. Uh, Kedar Masterberg was coming over because oh, uh, Kedar was putting he was had he was running Micah's deal. He was bringing Erica Badu, D'Angelo back in the day. Um, me and the cat Omari got in a huge fight, a huge fight, um, and I kicked him out. 
and he apologized a year later. And he said, and he was like, listen, I'm in Cincinnati. I'm working with these dudes named Mood. Um, I want to bring you out here to work with these cats because I, I like the, the vibe with them. And I was just, I was in New York. I was, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a job. I had dropped out of school. Um, I just went to Cincinnati and I was impressed because these guys in Cincinnati, they were, they were all hustling. And they all had Pathfinders and they all had studio in their house. And they were producing high quality hip hop completely outside of the music business. Right. Um, hot Tech Beats at that time was sounding like Diamond D Showbiz Beats to me. And I didn't know how he was doing it. You know what I'm saying? He was just, you know, and there was a bunch of that crew that got locked up right at the time I went out there. Like Hot Tech, Mood Crew, One Battle Crew, like a bunch of them got locked up. So there was just a, like a lot of free beats. <laughs> That's just what it was. It was a lot of free beats. You know what I'm saying? And, um, because Hot Tech wasn't, I, I, I already had a group called Reflection Eternal. It was me and my man Juju. But my man Juju, he was just, he wasn't really about it. Like, he was like, he wanted to get a regular job. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, he, he was talented, but he wasn't really trying to get on the Greyhound. That was all the time. Yeah. Right, right, of course. And, um, I just, I kept pressuring Hot Tech. Just let me get these beats. Let me get these beats. And finally, he gave me like three or four of them. And I made my first demo. And I had been doing Lyricist Lounge, but as like John Forte hype man. They would never let me do Lyricist Lounge by myself. Mm. They was like, oh, you can rap, but you know, you need the songs. You need, you know, when I came with them high tech beats and played my songs with high tech to Danny and Anthony, that's when I first got my first solo Lyricist Lounge. So I was, I was making a name for myself in the city, but no one really took me seriously until I had the production okay. to back the, you know, the rhymes. So most definitely quality are black star. I'm gonna save my musical life. <laughs> um, you guys weren't in a you weren't a group. You no, were not. No, most definitely just somebody I knew, and he was actually one of my favorite rappers because he had uh, UTDs, Ur Ur Urban Thermal Dynamics, Urban Thermal Dynamics. Yeah. and um, he was somebody who you know I was working at the bookstore, and he would come in the bookstore. He would be on TV. He was my man Dante. I would be like, that's Dante, you know, on, on, on the Cosby on the, show and on the, yeah. you know what I'm saying? He, he had a and show. the Deion Sanders commercial. Yeah, he had a Deion Sanders commercial. He had a show with Nell Carter. And the Theo from the Cosby show had a show for one year where he was a teacher. Yeah, I do remember that. And most was one of the kids in the class. So I would always see him in the park rhyming, and then I would see him on TV. And that was, that was it. Um, but he was, you know, his style was, his style, the way he raps now was just like how he rapped then. And so his style was just as developed it was just, it was really, I just, he, I was inspired by him because he took very high-minded concepts lyrically and put them in very simple boxes and rhyme structures. And that was something I strived to, to do, that I was looking to learn how to do. Um, he's a couple years older than me, so then his, his wife at the time, Jeannie, and, and, and my lady at the time, Darcel, had were pregnant at the same time. So we started hanging out together as like family unit. Before we'd start, we'd, he wasn't, he didn't even know I really rapped like that. He, was, he just came to the bookstore and I, I just was, I was a fan and then, you know, uh, our, our significant others became friends and I started, I found myself at his house. And he tells the story that I left the Reflection Eternal demo over there and his son Elijah played it. And that's how he heard it. He called me like, yo, Elijah played me this demo. He heard 2000 Seasons was on it. Um, no, that's, that's incorrect. 2000 Seasons wasn't on it. Um, what was on it? There was a song called Versus, me and Hot Tech over the Al Green sample. Where is that song? It's online. You can look it up. Okay. It's, it's, it's I think it's called Versus 95. iTunes, like Versus oh, 95. It's the, my, yeah. It was me and Hot Tech's first song we ever made together. Okay. Somehow, I don't even know who put it online. I just saw it online. It was online. Okay. Yeah. Um, there, was a song, there was Knowledge Itself, but Knowledge Itself wasn't over the Mini Ripperton sample. Right. It was over the, the sample that Rakim had for the ghetto. Yeah, so yeah. my vocals, I recorded over that. High Tech changed the beat. I didn't record over the mini ripping to sample. High Tech flipped it but when we put it on the Black Star. Because, you know, by that time I was two, three years old. So he was like, I need to make it fresher. Right, right. and put Vinny on Mohegan. Yeah, and then we put Vinny on it. And then Vinny, oh my God. Right. Vinny, I, <laughs> I, I, got, I, I took Vinny at Mohegan out for dinner and spent like, it was like the most expensive date. I was like 19 years old. I spent $800 or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, all my show money, trying to impress Vinnie Mojica to get her on my album. Ain't hey, my plan again. Live and direct, Boogie Down Productions is live! Right. Yeah. 
So you guys took two. I always say took. Right. It's important that I think I think it's very important that you guys use two Boogie Down production songs, which at the in time one? were like in one. <clears throat> well, you know that like I'm the I'm I'm like the opposite of most deaf when it comes to how I write. Um, I'm better now because I'm doing it for a living now. But when back then, I, if I for all those songs, I needed to take the beat, take it home, listen to it for a couple of weeks. Really think about what I'm gonna say. And come back. Come back, and a lot of times I would just try to fit rhymes that I already written over it, and try to fit the ones that fit. Most deaf would be like, "Yo, we should do this," and then he would do it, or he'd hear a beat like the beat for Brown Skin Lady. He'd be like, as "Soon as it came on, see, I think the hook was something he was already thinking in his head. As soon as it came on, he sang that hook, Brown Skin yeah, Lady, yeah. immediately." For that song, the reason why that song got done, he was like, yo, you know what we should do? He was just sitting there. He said, we should take the P is still free beat and sing Stop the Violence over it. And then High Tech said, okay. And he made the beat. So that just came out of Most Death's brain. That was just something that he was thinking that he wanted to do. Which at the time, Karis One was our best edutainer. Yeah. From 1987 to now, mm -hmm. he carried a, a certain message that we all, which turned into. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Recording live from somewhere. Lord, all night Sunday Central. Follow me now. Listen, say hi, Jake. Get your rolling hair. I remember having that album on tape first. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so you talk about Brown Skin Lady. Right. He shout out Jay Rolls on that because I'm, that's what was sitting in the room when he was recording the vocals. Mm -hmm. Hot tech, Jay Rolls. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, but those are the first two songs we did, Brown Skin Lady and that one. And that one. Yeah. Brown Skin Lady. And, and the thing about Brown Skin Lady, and I, you know, I, around my birthday, I was putting out these crazy play, playlists. Mm -hmm. basically, basically, it was playlists of my life, um, in a way. One of those playlists was a teenage love, mm -hmm. where all the songs in hip hop that dealt with love, mm -hmm. which everybody gives hip hop a bad thing about being misogynistic. Brown Skin Lady was not that. Mm -hmm at all, just like a lot of other songs mm -hmm. wasn't like that about about downplaying and talking down on women. Brown Skin Lady was an upliftment song about how beautiful women were. Mm -hmm. Talk about Brown Skin Lady for a second. Like. Um, well, no, Brown Skin Lady was definitely very deliberate um, based on deliberate conversations of loving hip hop, watching hip hop videos. It was a big thing back then where you watch a video and be like, damn, you can't get no dark and sisters in the videos? Like, I haven't seen a hip-hop video in a long time, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I don't know if they're still doing that. But, but um, that's what it was. It was like us watching the video, watching Rap City, watching, you know, whatever in program. I don't even, there was no 106 at Park back then. So it was, back then it was like, yo, MTV Raps, Rap City, The base, Basement. Not even The Basement, just Rap City, or Prince Jour or something like that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, um, and it would just be like, Man, how come we can't get no darkest sisters in the videos? Or when you hear a song, Back then, and it still happens now, but a lot of times you hear a song by a rapper and the way they to describe women is she's light skinned, she has green eyes, she looks like she's mixed with Brazilian, and she's, and um, that shit, that's fly too, you know, but, but I felt like, I just felt like with me growing up with a mother who had dark skinned aunts who had dark skinned grandmother with dark skin, I didn't, I didn't feel like they were represented. Um, and then when they were represented, it was like, wow, there goes a, a dark skinned sister. So it was like the exception that proves the rule to be true. Um, so that was just us being young men feeling like we needed to make, we needed to say something about this, you know. Um, and again, most came with the hook. As soon as the beat was played, most started singing. And immediately, you know, I started thinking about cocoa butter. And so that's why I rapped about it, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, that sound like the butters, you know. Got to tell the white people about the butters. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
That's actually Genie right there. Um, wow. So this is respiration featuring Com. <coughs> yeah. Talk about the first time, because when we get into this thing, we always want to be accepted mm -hmm. by our predecessors or who we feel like the legends. So talk about the first time being accepted. We all want to be accepted by a tribe called Quest. Let's just right. be right. honest. That's exactly right. Tribe the roots, That's exactly accept right. us, please. That's like those That's are the exactly two. It. That's exactly right. Right. So, talk about the first time being accepted in the Q-tip family tree. Well, I mean, you know, um, I got to know Q-tip really. I've been a huge Q-tip fan, and and, and that that lyricist lounge that I performed at for the first time by myself. Q-tip was the host. Wow. And when I walked off stage, he was like, yo, you nice, money. I never, forget, I never forget that. It. Months later, I heard that he said, Quali got a funny voice, which I was like, man, fuck Q-Tip. <laughs> 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 How Q-Tip gonna say somebody got a funny voice? <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I had heard that. Um, <laughs> you know, but Q-Tip is a very reserved dude, and he, and he, and he, he, he keeps his circle very tight. Mm -hmm. Most deaf, I'm not a Muslim. Most deaf is. Q-Tip is. Um, rest in peace to Shaka, who was Q-Tip's good, good, dear friend, yep. who had just got out of prison right when Black Star came out. So Shaka, Q-Tip, Big Muhammad, most formed this like Muslim alliance. And they was going to the mosque every, you know, all the time. And they all went to travel to Mecca together. Q-Tip didn't go on that trip, but right. they all traveled to, to, to Mecca together. Um, most was really, really getting on his dean at that time. And him and Q-Tip formed a spiritual bond. Um, that I just, I really wasn't privy to. Um, I wasn't part of. I wasn't, most, he had, he had a couple years on me. He, by the time we did Black Star, he was already hanging out with Q-Tip every day. He had already toured with De La, been on the De La album, had a relationship with Common. I didn't really know any of them. I was just that kid who raps with Forte still at that point. Right. Um, and so Common at that point was my favorite MC. I was like, Common is the best. No one's better than Common. Right. Um, he had a show at Wetlands. I was determined I was gonna get him on the Black Star album. No, not Wetlands of Tramps. Doesn't exist anymore, but um went to the show, went early. He's on his tour bus doing an interview with Joe Claire. Okay. Right? If you you can watch it, I haven't I I don't know if it's online, but if you watch it, you see him doing an interview, you see me in the back with a book bag on. You know what I'm saying? Oh like, wow. Like just waiting for him. And they walk by me a couple times and I'm like, but I don't get their attention. <laughs> right? <laughs> Then I, I, this one I met Derek Dudley. Okay. I met he said I knew he was Common's manager. I tried to he, he was he was letting all the girls on the bus. He wouldn't let me on the bus. Right? <laughs> then here come Corey Smith. This is how I met Corey Smith. Uh huh. Actually, I probably had to meet him before because he came out the bus. He said, "Quali, what you doing?" I didn't recognize him, but once he said Quali, I was like, "Yo, I'm trying to get on the bus." He was like, "You shouldn't be out here." Corey brought me on the bus. That's how me and Corey's relationship started. I don't remember where he knew me from, but I used that. I was like, "Okay, well, he know me from." <laughs> Yeah, get yeah, man, yeah, I know you. Yeah, come yeah, on, let's go. Let's right. go. Um, I asked Common to get on a song. He said, yeah, I gave him the beat, but it wasn't that beat. It was it was the beat for another song that we ended up doing with Dead Press called Sharpshooters. Okay. Because I was dead set on that beat. I chased Common around the country to get this song done. We went to the Gavin in San Diego. We had a show with the Belly Up. I went to the show. Derek Dudley went and let me backstage again. Hated on, you, on your boy. Common, <laughs> Common saw me. Common recognized me like, oh, you most death boy. Brought me on the bus. We chopped it up, he agreed to do it. Most had a show in Chicago a few months later. I took the, the Amtrak from New York to Chicago so I could go talk to Common. So that night, it was Most and Common doing a show. I got on, I did Fortify Live with Most. Then Common was like, yo, let's go to the studio right now and do the song. So we did the song that night after, but then nobody wanted to use the beat. After I've been trying to get him on this beat. So then I, I think I, I must have had a temper tantrum. I got really upset. <laughs> Me and High Tech started arguing. I was like, no, this the beat. High Tech was like, no, I want to use this beat, the respiration beat. And so we played it for everybody. Everybody voted against me. Everybody was like, this is a better beat. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I was, you know, you, what it was was I had that CD with that beat 
for like eight months trying to get Common to rap on that beat. So he finally get to the studio, he's like, I don't want to rap on that beat. I was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> but it all worked out the way it was supposed to. And which is funny is because in 2001, you came to do a show at Cat's Cradle. And in the crowd was me, a kid by the name Fonte Coleman, mm -hmm. and uh, a soul singer by the name of Yazara. Mm -hmm. So we all went to the show together. And Yazara at the time was singing back up for Erica Badu. She's in the right. bag lady. I was on that tour. Right. The Mama's Gun tour. So Yazara was out in. I know I know Kwali, I know him. Right. So Is we that came why she by. That <laughs> <laughs> we came by your hotel. We was like, we're gonna go get Kwali and we're gonna take him to the Waffle House. What? So <laughs> <laughs> So we came by your hotel. I don't I don't remember this at all. This, I, is, I, this is news this to is me. Vivid. Okay. We came by your hotel, we picked you oh, up. Man, you're gonna say something embarrassing. No, not. <laughs> no, not. You said, you Fonte was driving, we put you in the we put you in the passenger seat. Damn, Fonte was driving. Y'all are all sitting beside me. And Fonte played my beats for you for the first time. I don't remember this at all. And we went <laughs> at all. Somebody has a picture we is cause Chop was DJ Chop Chops? Chaps. Chaps. Yeah. And we went to the Waffle House, man. <laughs> like I mean that sounds like what I would have did. Crazy. It was crazy. But it was during the Man, and that was one of the moments in time that I and mean, I think Fonte played a song. And that you know it's a rock. We went to the Waffle House on fifty the corner of fifty four and Fayetteville. Because I'm gonna just tell you like at that point for, for the people that me, live here, that's no, a ways no, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what it is. It was all planned. I'm from New planned. York. I'm on, I'm from New York. <laughs> and and ain't no Waffle House in New York. So when you go on tour, I don't do it no more because I don't, I don't fuck with Waffle House no more. That was, that was when I was a much younger man. My stomach could handle that. You know what I'm but back then it was like there was if we can't anytime we toured, we have to whenever we come, especially to North Carolina or one of these places, we have to find a Cracker Barrel. We have to find a Waffle House because then we don't have that in New York. And so we went to Waffle House, and that 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 changed our we that changed our life. We thought that we had something at least. The song that we played for you at the time, we put on the listening called Nighttime Maneuvers. Um, wow. Which is crazy, but. So, the one thing about Rock is what Rock is did. Rock is started, first it was as an underground label, but then started to challenge the status quo, which means y'all started to get records on the radio. Mm -hmm. That scared the hell out of labels. Mm -hmm. um, you became in direct competition with you know, it was Simon Says, mm -hmm. it was Omi Says, mm -hmm. it was Miss Fat Booty, mm -hmm. and it was this. So this was like, this is the blast by um, <coughs> Reflection Eternal. Mm -hmm. Now you're in another group, I guess. Or that was your first group. Or yeah, I'm, I'm, now it's me and Style Speed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Last year it was me and Night One. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but the blast was our, in 2000, 2001, our way to turn to all the Cash Money fans was like, yeah, it's us. Right. We on TV. Like, <laughs> that was our proud, shining moment because the whole argument had been, if you make this certain type of music, you can't profit from it. Right. Nor can you get on TV. That's the commercial. It was commercial versus underground. That was the new divide. Before right. the internet, before all of that, we didn't have that. Uh, tribe and Two Short was looked at as the same kind of rap. It That's just didn't right. matter. This toured together and all that. Exactly, but now it was us versus them. Mm -hmm. The Roots talked about it the first time with, with what they do. What they do, yeah. Right. Which if that was video ended up being very decisive, di divisive in New York City. Exactly. Yeah. Very. It just split it right down the middle. Everybody talked about the East and West beef, but the underground versus commercial beef is <coughs> a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. Talk about. Now entering in a space where other rappers are looking at you like, yeah. You. Well, what's interesting is like I mentioned before, I worked with Puff in them. Right. So my experience was started when we came out on Raucous. There was a division between my experience and the the experience of a Black Star fan. Like for what he's talking about, like was wasn't necessarily my experience because Puff, you know, Puff Big Big and Craig Mack and them came to the Lyricist Lounge. Puff was at the Lyricist Lounge. So, yeah, he blew up and he decided to sample, you know, Prince or whatever it was he was sampling at the time. Um, but this was somebody I had a relationship with. 
This was somebody, Funkmaster Flex, I, I work, when I worked with Funkmaster Flex, there was no Hot 97. So, Hot 97, there was Hot 97, it was a freestyle station. They played right. like Stevie B records, like, of course. you gotta believe there's something inside of, like right. that type of shit, right? <laughs> um, Funkmaster Flex had two hours on Friday nights and Saturday nights. And during those two hours, he played Gangstar, Nice and Smooth, De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, you know, like, those are the, those, that was that was pop hip hop at that time. Right. Um, so my relation with Funkmaster Flex was that's the that's the underground hip hop DJ. He right. wasn't he wasn't the corporate big dog marketer. It wasn't none of exactly. that. Exactly. That's that's the dude who reps the culture. Right. Diddy was the dude throwing the hottest parties, repping the culture. So when they blew up nationwide, it was never a divide for me. But now I came out on Raucous. Whereas there was an experience when Most Def performed Children's Story at Lyricist Lounge the year after Biggie died. Puff came to Lyricist Lounge and saw Most Def perform Children's Story and came backstage and was like, why is y'all dissing? You know, and Most was like, well, that record's not necessarily about you. It's about the culture. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about track masters as well. Because Puff became the enemy right. a lot. Right. But it was a thing where, you know, that's where I sort of divide happened. When he, when he came backstage at this Lyricist Lounge show, this was when, this was in 97. No, this was in 98, no, it was 97. This was a night, it was a couple of weeks after Big Ed passed. Um, and everybody was like, what's he doing here? Oh, Big, Biggie's going now, now he's gonna take someone else? Like, it was kind of like a tense thing, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I think he was just showing like, yo, I'm still down with y'all, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, when Raucous got on the map, you're right, it was that divide, but I never saw it like that. People would do interviews with us. Me and Most had a running joke. The joke was that we broke up with Puff and Jay Z. You know what I'm saying? Because we do interviews and people were like, so what do you think of Puff? And what do you think of Puffy? And Most be like, well, you know, he he, he took the VCR when he left. <laughs> but, you know what I'm saying? Like, because it was so ridiculous that these interviewers were trying to pit us against people that we were in this. It worked. It, you know what I'm saying? It worked. So that was a thing. I I actively. At that moment, if you read my interviews, Magnet, I, every interview, I'm like, no, I'm not, it's not underground. I was actively pushing back against it because I saw it. And I saw, what I saw was kids coming in from, not who weren't from the city, you know, a lot of white kids from Connecticut coming in with backpacks, wearing backpacks to the shows, empty backpacks. Yeah. To say that they was down with the backpacker thing. Like, when we was had backpacks, we had like knives. And guns and stuff. You know what I'm right. saying? And exactly. like, like, like weed and like, Clothes, water, fruit. When I put on my backpack, to, it was full. When I put on my Timberlands, it was to go and walk around for 20 hours, 22 hours, walk around the city, going to Cypher to Cypher. Like, the backpack thing was a very practical thing. But then it became a... A way of life. Yeah, like, we backpack hip-hop. Not You don't have anything in that backpack. Backpack. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, um, so I, I saw that, I saw, I saw, it was very important to me. And I think it reflects in my musical choices and the albums that I made after that, especially with, you know, Eardrum, Beautiful Struggle. Uh, I think I refined it a little bit more with Eardrum, but the, the musical choice, working with, with Pharrell, working with Mary J. Blige, mm -hmm. I wanted to be like, no, 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 I respect these people. And I, exactly. I need people to understand that I don't see a division. You know what I'm saying? But that, it was tough for me, too, to find my footing in, in all that. Which, which, you know, everybody liked to throw around at that particular time the conscious you listen to conscious rap I mean, and and at first when little brother first got in it you know we spoke against that too because fonte spoke about that against right. that all the time if you the, actually I listen to his lyrics artists, he's unconscious as hell the art it was always a fan <laughs> thing with that as a consumer not even a fan thing because right. the fans understand a consumer right. thing of course. you know the, the artist really always which is why you have a knife wonder come out the gate and boom is his little brother then is jay-z out the gate, you right? Because the fan, the, the 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 young gurus and the Jay Zs of the world, they understood. You know? A lot of young people here, they you know, they don't understand the inst the focus or the instrumental place you have in this guy's life. Yeah. The beat maker on this song. That song and um and this song. Yeah. Talk about the first time meeting in the maturation of Kanye West. 
First time I met Kanye West, I was working on a quality album. I was in um, the Cutting Room Studios. And um, I really wanted most on a quality album. We hadn't done Joy yet. Um, and I was waiting, I kept waiting for most to come to the studio. And one night, instead of most coming, Kanye came. And I never heard of him, never seen him, didn't know anything about him. He asked for most deaf. Um, um, no, that's incorrect. I had heard the name. He asked for most deaf. I'm like, he's not here. I'm like, but you, I'm Kanye West. You got the beats, right? He said, yeah, he played me a couple beats. And the beats he played me in that session was Gorilla Monsoon Rap, uh, Good To You, and maybe one other. But I, I bought all those beats that day. You know what I'm saying? Like, Meeting Kanye West was very similar. The feeling was very similar to meeting Hot Tech. You're hearing this level of professionalism, this level of creativity, this level of artistic genius that you're like, how, how is this amateur? How right. does no one know about this? Right. Um, and then it turns out he had been ghost producing. He produced a, a couple of my favorite records on the Beanie Siegel albums, yeah. which I didn't know at the time. He had been doing some ghost producing for D-Dot and for Jermaine Dupri. When I went back and researched, I'm like, okay, um, the beats was incredible, um, and I, because I bought like a number of beats at once, he started just hanging around the studio. And so when I went on the tour with Common, um, at the time I, I was it was Electric Circus tour. I was opening for Common. Kanye was in New York, trying to get a deal. He had already had like uh, H to the Izzo had dropped, but no one wanted to sign Kanye West as nope, an artist. Sure didn't. And so he was very frustrated, and he came to me and Corey with his frustrations, what should I do? And I invited him to come on the road with me. Um, and that's when I really got to know Kanye and GLC on the Electric Circus tour. He came out and we do three, four songs on my set. Um, but that was, you know, that, that's, that, that tour is really what solidified what we were doing. Which turned into uh, later on. 26 plus double D, you nine girls See now, my verse has flown in wrong on that song, did you know that? Say what? My verse has flown in wrong on that song. That's not how, where I rapped it on the beat. That's not, it, not wow. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beat behind. Behind. And this is get him high, get him high from Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I actually recorded my vocals on a tour bus in like Switzerland. Um, like the night before he had to turn it in. And so when I heard it, it was wrong. <laughs> but it was already out. I bought it at Target and put it in. And I was, <laughs> I was like, that's wrong. <laughs> but it, it is crazy that you said that, you know, we see where Kanye West is now, mm -hmm. but we both remember the time where he walked around with the college dropout on CD mm -hmm. saying, nobody understands this. That's right. Which is a testament for people who listen to music. Like there are so many artists that's out here mm -hmm. that's just sitting because some label head doesn't understand what they're trying to do. Kanye no, he didn't, he didn't just have co college dropout though. He had he had a lot of songs. college dropout. He had most of late registration. Done. You know, there was a lot that, like, you know, he one of the one of the first songs I played Kanye was played for me before years before he had a deal was was uh Hey Mama, Dear Mama. Or Hey Mama, right? Hey Mama, Jesus Walks. He played them songs for me off top. Hooks done. Everything. Everything done. And he he told me in in 2003 that I'm gonna get a song about Jesus played in the club, and I just looked yeah. at him like, "Wow!" He said it on he's he said it on the song. Right here goes a single dog. Right, tell radio to play this. Whatever he says in the song, he says, uh, "Yeah, he had that record. Uh, and there was a, that was a fight. He put the record out himself. The label didn't put that record out. Right, he put it out himself." So I, I made the Black Album in 2003. Mm -hmm. I got a you know it was my first, as you say, my you know stepping out of what's underground and what's not. And I remember Jay-Z coming from, um, my song was done, and he said, well, I'm going to see Eminem, and then he came back with a song called Moment of Clarity. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he specifically said to me, I want you to hear the second verse. So this is the second verse for Moment of Clarity. That's Jay Z saying, <laughs> you know, lyrics is sold. I probably, truthfully, I probably be Talib Kweli lyric. You know, truthfully, I want to be like Common Sense. I did five million. I ain't rhyme like Common Sense. Uh -huh. That was Jay Z saying that 
talk about that recognition because that's like um it just it felt like the right place at the right time for me um it made me it, it, it validated for myself what i was doing um jay me being from brooklyn um me being a lyricist me being someone who is very very passionate about hip-hop culture i have a great deal of respect for jay-z as he's i mean he's one of my favorites one of my biggest inspirations as someone who you know came up in his era under Brooklyn, I, I, in his era of the, the 10 summers in a row, what he has given to the game is, is it can't be measured. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, Jay-Z is a capitalist. 100%. And he's very good at it. Very good at it. He's, he's, oh, he's almost as good as a rapper as he is as a capitalist. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> um, but in his early when, when Jay-Z first started from Reasonable Doubt he made his intentions very clear he's rapping about big boy shit he's rapping about money he's rapping about making money meet me at the crap tables like you know and I mean? the regret of it yeah right. he's, rap, he's rapping about his whole thing is from the hustler's perspective I, I understand manifest destiny when, when Jay-Z said my name, it made me realize that I completely manifested what I set out to do. Right. Jay-Z manifested to be the, the he was, he's like, I love hip hop. I love Common and Quali, but really I want to be rich. Right, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? Really. And I'll do what I need to do to be rich. I love hip hop and I'm, a, I'm good at that, but really I'm about this paper. And, and, and he, by, by sticking to that script, he has become the symbol for the rich rapper. When you think about the successful rapper, Jay-Z has manifested that destiny. My focus was never about money until recently. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> until very recently. You know what I'm saying? Like, until very recently, until I started Javoti Media. Like, I didn't care about money. All I cared about was, I want other rappers to say he's nice. That's all I cared about. Right. All I wanted to be was respected for my lyrics. And so in 2003, or whenever he said that, that's like the pinnacle. It's like the biggest rapper said, I respect that guy for his lyrics. So it made me realize, maybe I should have rapped about money a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, of course I thought that. Of course I'm like, man, he gave me, man, I've been spending all this time rapping about being a good rapper. Then now all the rappers think I'm a good rapper. Maybe if I rapped about money, I'd have a lot more money because it's hard out here. <laughs> but... Had I tried to rap about money, I'd be a B, C, D level Jay-Z. I'd just be another, there's a lot of rappers, especially in New York, that will have great radio hits. They got the look, the hat is right, the chain is nice. But they're not Jay. They're not Jay-Z. Right. You know, they're guys who are trying to be the capitalist, rich rapper, Forbes list, I'm so rich and I'm a hustler. They can't do it like Jay-Z. I had to do, if I tried to do what he was doing, I would be a lesser me. I had to just do what I'm doing. And the cultural currency is going to have to just be worth it. And he straddles the fence. He talks about money, but he talks about in a wordplay type of way that mm -hmm. makes us respect it. Right. Real quick, um, fast forward to now. You the Twitter troll killer, man. <laughs> <laughs> you, you kill trolls every day. Like, trolls <laughs> die. I, that's not hyperbole either, man. They did delete their accounts. And <laughs> right, that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> talk about that for a few moments. <laughs> well, one thing that people I think have to understand is that at this stage in my life, I don't do anything I don't thoroughly enjoy. <laughs> you know what I'm and you so, enjoy it. That's oh, I thoroughly you enjoy it. So it. people sometimes people see my timeline. They be like, Squally seems so stressed out. How could it be? He loves You're it. stressed out. Yeah, he loves it. He loves I'm it. chilling. I'm probably in like a hammock somewhere. We were in Denver together yeah. on, on tour and we're on a show and you were just killing somebody on tour. You were smiling at the same time. <laughs> Are you having a great time? Yeah. It's but like, I mean, beyond me enjoying it, I think the reason I enjoy it is because it's built for the MC. You know, 140 characters, that's like two bars. And Twitter forces you to, to fit your thoughts. Like Facebook, Facebook is for idiots because you could just... Blah, 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 forever. Twitter, you gotta, you gotta be clever. You gotta be clever. You gotta figure out how to make it fit. And so, as an MC, that's just a useful skill for me to have. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, when I'm doing it, it's like it, it's very, it's very practical for me. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Now, on top of that, we in the era we just dropped an album. You know what I'm saying? Yep. When when Adele dropped an album, 
You gonna see it on Target. You gonna see it on everywhere. Everywhere. When me and Knife drop an album, shit, you might see it on Hip Hop DX. Maybe. We got on Fallon though, at least. We did. We got on Fallon. Partly because I be on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> and this is this is the point I'm getting to. <coughs> is that because we don't because artists who are independent don't have marketing dollars. I utilize the digital space to, to I, I will never be not relevant, but me injecting my personality into that digital space it, it ensures that people want I, people want to hear what I got to say. And if I got a chance to talk about my album on top of that, from Twitter, I'm, I'm doing, I do Bill Maher, I do Democracy Now, I do Jimmy Fallon. CNN. These, these are not because I got hit records. These are because I am who I am in, in, in this digital space. Um, and the last thing I want to add, I know we probably just ran out of time, but I think it's a very important piece. Um, because I choose to speak out, and anyone who's an activist or, or does any type of you know, progressive direct action work, when you choose to engage and you choose to speak out, people come to you. I don't complain about trolls because they come to me because they know I'm gonna respond. When I saw Leslie Jones, with all due respect to my sister Leslie Jones, like she got very, very upset, <coughs> rightfully so. But I also wanted to tell her, Leslie, it's because you answered him. You do be responding to them, and you, you know, you, and it's like, it, it, if you're not ready for that, like I come from, like I told you, I come from the gods and earths. We was building and destroying on a corner, and if you didn't have your math right, you might get into a fight. That's right. So online is light work, that's nothing. I do that with one thumb walking through Raleigh Durham. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, it's not any, I'm not using up any brain, extra brain power for me to tweet all day. Um, matter of fact, it's helping, it's like a, that X, that, that was Lumin, Lumina, whatever, they got sued. <laughs> they got sued, right? The fake brain brain activities. <laughs> like I, my my shit is real. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I'm, I'm 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 because I engage. I was blessed and privileged to see some of the problems we're having beforehand. So Breitbart.com was writing articles about me disparaging me last year, and I was telling people, you don't see these white supremacists talking about me. No one cared. You know what I'm saying? I was I was looking at I was getting trolled by fake black accounts. People come, people telling me all types of white supremacist stuff, and I look at their page, there's no potato salad, <laughs> there's no new edition song, there's no nothing. I'm like, you ain't black. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you talk about Trump and how you love Tommy Lauren or whatever her name is, and you ain't black. Bro. Like, I can tell. And they, and they get, like, a lot of those, those, those fake black accounts, they get so mystified. Like, how, you, you're such a racist. How can you tell from a tweet that I'm not black? Because I'm black, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, I'm seeing this ahead of time. And I'm seeing how I'm seeing what's happening with InfoWars and what's happening with Breitbart and how a large portion of our society is coming to them and saying, this is my most trustworthy source of news. Sites and outlets that are actively white supremacists. These are people talking about Obama's an alien. These are people talking about Black Lives Matter or terrorists. These are people talking about birth control makes women go crazy. These, you know, these, these are people talking about Bill Crystal is a renegade Jew. These are people talking about the proud and glorious heritage of the Confederate flag. These are actually Breitbart headlines. I'm not making this up. You know what I'm saying? These are literal Breitbart headlines. And one of the other headlines is Talib Kweli is a racist. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm getting it personal because I choose to engage. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, yo, this bright. So come summertime, Trump makes Steve Bannon uh, his campaign advisor. So I'm seeing how Breitbart is pushing this Trump agenda. So is Trump. Trump hires the head of Breitbart. I think Trump won because he hired the head of Breitbart. Because those Breitbart, there's a, there's, a, there's a meme of Trump with a football throwing it over the mainstream media and is reaching like a white supremacist on his couch. Trump, in the, in the summertime, when he hired Kellyanne Conway, when he hired Steve Bannon, he decided, you know what, I'm, I, don't, I'm not, I don't care about the mainstream media. I don't care about CBS, uh, CNN. I don't care about MSNBC. I don't care about uh, Huffington Post. I don't care about... Washington Post, New York Times, that's fake news. So make my own I'm gonna make my facts. own thing and my own thing. And I'm gonna have the the people who are already doing that for me, I'm gonna hire them. And then he won, and now this man is chief of staff. You know what I'm saying? Now this man is chief of staff. So now you have right wing trolls getting more emboldened. Now you have right wing trolls going and shooting up mosques. You know, they told us this was a Muslim dude from Morocco, turns out it's a white supremacist. You know what I'm saying? Um, so the idea that we have this luxury to ignore trolls just because it's a digital space. It's asinine. You may not have the stamina or the information to do what I do. 
You may not be able to tweet every two minutes, and that's fine. But <laughs> yeah, it, most people can. I get it. But you got to be doing some. Don't come up and tell me to ignore the trolls, and all you ever did for activism is retweet Stop Coney. For real. <laughs> if you're not part of no active organization, if you're not giving money to some sort of you know, ACLU, even though they got a lot of money, but somebody, if you're not doing something, don't tell me what not to do. Or don't tell me. And what you're doing, you're actively trying to silence us. You know what I'm saying? Like, listen, I've, I've dealt with, I've had rocks thrown at me from when I was a kid in the street. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've had, I've faced police at protests, and it's like, nothing moves without the flesh. Every movement we've seen is the flesh. Online is a tool. Nothing moves without the flesh. But I, I implore people, do not discount these so-called trolls because those trolls got organized by Reddit and 4chan and Breitbart and Infowars and they got their man in office. You know what I'm saying? While we was talking about ignore the trolls, talking about let's take the high road, let's go high, that might work for Michelle Obama, but she wasn't running. Hillary was running. You know what I'm saying? And maybe Michelle could have gone high. <laughs> right. But Hillary needed to get in that dirt and fight them trolls. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Mr. Talib Kweli, everybody. <laughs> And um, I just want to thank y'all for your time and your energy. It's my honor and my pleasure to, to talk with y'all and share my experience with y'all. And just, I'm, I'm humbled by the fact that y'all even want to hear all this. So thank y'all. I appreciate it. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.